Okay, friends, I'm going to start reading a pleasure reading book for us. Uh, the Toothpaste Millionaire uh, by Jean Merrill. And this author also wrote The Pushcart War. And I picked this book up. I thought, okay, you know, we'll, we'll read this. And then when I, I had a memory, when I was a child, this was an after school special. And I didn't make the connection until much later. So I am a little bit familiar with this book. <clears throat> so we'll um, hopefully just read chapter one. My friend Rufus. This is a story of my friend Rufus Mayflower and how he got to be a millionaire with a little help from me, with a lot of help from me, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, but the idea was Rufus's. Rufus's idea was to become a millionaire, just to make toothpaste. He was 12 and in the sixth grade at the time. By the time Rufus goes into eighth grade this fall, he'll have over a million dollars in the bank. I don't suppose you know too many eighth graders who are millionaires. And you wouldn't know Rufus was one to look at him. He still wears that same old blue sweater. First, I'll tell you how Rufus and I got to be such good friends. Since I'm white and he's black, and this seems to surprise some people. <clears throat> Two years ago, the company my father works for moved, to, moved from Connecticut to Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio. In Connecticut, we lived in the suburbs. You may not believe it, but up to the time we moved to Cleveland, I had never met a black person. There weren't any black families where we lived in Connecticut, but in East Cleveland, where we live now, there are quite a few. East Cleveland is an old neighborhood with big houses and lawns and trees that look a hundred years old. My father says you can buy a new house built as well as these. Big, you can't buy a new house as, as <clears throat> well as these big old houses. Our house in Cleveland has a lot more rooms than our house in Connecticut. There's a room called a conservatory, which is just for plants. And there's a huge laundry, ro laundry room and workshop, which came in handy when Rufus decided to make toothpaste. I didn't meet Rufus until several weeks after school started. Sometimes it's hard making friends in a new neighborhood. And the kids on my block weren't too friendly at first. It was okay at school, but after school and on the weekends, it was lonely. There wasn't anybody to hang around with but my brother, James and he isn't interested in anything but model cars. You know, his conversation isn't very interesting. Now, if you've ever had a brother who's crazy about model cars, you know his conversation isn't very interesting. You can't even understand it. It's all about camshafts and gear ratios and RPMs. I know that if you want to make friends, you have to be friendly. And I tried. There were two girls about my age, Clem and Josie, who lived in the house next door. And I thought it would be easy to make friends with them. One afternoon, I saw them watching me pick, up, uh, pick apples from this nice old apple tree we have in the backyard. And I invited them to come over and pick some apples if they wanted, but they said no. Another time when Clem broke her badminton racket, I called over to ask if she wanted to borrow one of mine, but she didn't. Badminton is like tennis. Maybe they didn't like apples or were tired of playing badminton. But I had the feeling it was that they didn't want to get involved with me. Maybe because I was white. One of the nice things about Rufus is this. 
Let's make sure I'm on the right page. One of the nice things about Rufus is this. He doesn't seem to mind that I'm white and he's black. He doesn't even mind that I'm a girl. My brother James, though, can hardly stand it that I'm a girl. This can be pretty annoying in a nine-year-old boy. With Rufus, I didn't even have to try to make friends. It was as if we all always had been from the first day I met him. I was riding my bike to school and the strap that I used to hold my books on the back of the bike broke. I heard my books go thunking all over the street. Well, I pulled up to the curve and was trying to figure out how to rescue the books. Papers from my notebook were blowing all over the place. Every time I ducked into the street to grab a paper, cars started honking their horns. It was the rush hour and nobody wanted to stop. Suddenly, this kid on a bike pulls up behind me. He jumps off his bike and runs into the middle of the street and puts his hands, puts up his hands like a traffic, traffic cop. Take your time, he says to me, and then he gets up, gets the traffic under control. He helps me pick up all of my stuff. Some kids who lived on my street were standing on the sidewalk laughing at the two of us crawling under cars. One of them yelled, hey, Rufus. You'll be late for school. Rufus didn't pay any attention except to explain to me. That's my name, Rufus. Rufus tried to fix my broken book strap, but when he tried, uh, when he tied it together, it wasn't long enough to go around the books. Never mind, he said. I'll put them in my saddlebags. Rufus had these beautiful blue nylon saddlebags that fit over the carrier of his bike. Those are neat, I said. Where'd you get them? Made them, Rufus said. He stuffed my books into the top of the saddlebags. Can't spill out of there, he said. Come on, we'll see, uh, we'll see who's late for school. He waved at the kids on the sidewalk as we zoomed past them on our bikes. When I pulled up beside him at a red light, Rufus said, I'll make you <clears throat> some if you get the material. Some what? I said, saddlebags, Rufus said. You can get waterproof nylon in red, orange, blue, or black at Vince's Army and Navy. At the next traffic light, he said, you don't need to buy leather for the straps. I've got some leftover from making my saddlebags. All you need is the nylon. Oh, and that's the end of the chapter. So I'll stop there. <clears throat>